So I went and I looked at all this stuff, and I went and I tied some uh, deep wigglers. It's a fly, I used to call it a double or nothing fly for smallmouth. I'd spot a smallmouth, and I put my anchor down, I tell my client, if you can catch him, and if you can catch him, I say, okay, I'll bet you double or nothing. If I can't catch it in three casts, um, you don't have to pay me today. But if I catch it in three casts, you got to pay me double. You take take the bet. And I never lost a bet. And I, I used to practice with a red Brillo pad and an ice fishing weight. That was Larry Dahlberg describing the deep wiggler and the bet he never lost. The guy who invented Flashaboo today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Larry Dahlberg, a huge influencer in the fly and gear fishing space, tells the story of how he put it all together. Larry describes how the hunt for huge fish TV show came to be, the story behind the Dahlberg Diver, and some other game-changing products today. Listen to Larry get fired up in this one as I make the distinction between fly and gear angling, a line that uh, Larry doesn't uh, totally recognize. Before we get started, let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. In today's world of mass-produced products, Stonefly Nets has reclaimed the tradition of handcrafted care with their custom wood landing nets. Please head over to wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to get your custom net today. That's wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to get started right now. So, without further ado, here is Larry Dahlberg from huntforbigfish.com. How's it going, Larry? Well, I, I think it's going great. I'm not medically qualified to answer your question, but uh, I think my pulse is at about 45. Yeah. And uh, I'm wide awake. So you're, you're healthy. You're, that's a good thing. Are you, you, you managed to uh, get, get past the COVID? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Um, you're still alive. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to, uh, your name has come up a number of times from guests that we've had on the show and. Um, I can't remember the last person. I think we were talking about bass fishing, and but you've done a lot of stuff in the fishing space, uh, including a TV show, Hunt for you know the Hunt for Big Fish, which is was on for a long time. We're going to dig into that and some of the stuff, some of the the products you've developed. Um, but first, can you just talk about how you first got into fishing and maybe bring that to fly fishing? I, I know you've done a little bit of fly fishing as well. How did that all begin? Well, and my, my dad was just a you know liked to fish, and he did it in a lot of different ways. And uh, always in the spring, he would fish for sunfish uh, to eat and uh, also ice fishing. My first fish was uh, ice fishing. And uh, that was a little short rod that uh, you jiggle up and down, you know, and try to get a fish to bite. And uh, uh, I can remember the bobber going down. I pulled up the line. My dad was kind of hollering and uh, he was reasoning to holler. And I was dumping the line on top of the wood stove. And, uh, but that was my first fish, and then I, my first uh, memory of uh, open water fishing was uh, standing in water up to my waist with a little, about a, it was actually an ice fishing rod that was too long for the, for the uh, ice fishing shack that my dad had put a, a little fly line on, and I was standing next to him uh, flopping a black mat back and forth, uh, catching sunfish when I was, I guess, five, six years old. And uh, then I, the next outfit I had, same year, was a Fluger skill cast bait casting outfit with a 54 pound line on it. And uh, I would be allowed to fish in a little reservoir at home, um, off the dock at my great grand or my grandfather's cabin. And I just uh, evolved into fishing, and uh, the fly fishing part was just um, a natural part of it. Uh, we had uh, spinning uh, was not popular then because the lines and the gear were somewhat unreliable but everybody had a fly rod this is and a a bait casting outfit uh, after uh, world war ii Uh, where we lived in this part of the country uh, people fished primarily for uh, pan fish or uh, largemouth bass smallmouth bass for fly rods a little bit of trout but in this region uh, the streams weren't too amenable for that and so you know, I got into it. It's just part of it's just part of the stuff you have with you, and it has its time and its place. For me, fishing is 
is in, it kind of always has been. I, I, I'm a non-superstitious person. And, uh, as I get older and old, older, I'm even less and less superstitious about everything. I doubt everything. And, um, so I have to kind of create systems so that I'm, I can be more sure. I have to see it a hundred times before I believe it. And as far as angling goes, I, I break it down into, uh, three things, uh, a strategy, tactics, and mechanics. And sometimes it might involve a fly rod and sometimes it might not. Uh, the strategy is based upon purely observations of what are the environmental options? Where's the food? Where's the cover? Uh, tactics are, hmm, what's the best way for me to cover this particular area that I've decided might be worth fishing? The mechanics are, can I do it? <laughs> can I cast 90 feet, mend it, and get a dead drift for eight feet? Or, you know, can I control my boat in 60 feet of water and I've got a little tiny hump I'm trying to, trying to hit? And, uh, you know, on and on and on and on. But those are the, those are the three elements uh, in angling. You break it down, it doesn't matter if you're, you're fishing blue marlin with a 130-pound gear or you're in a brook trout stream that's uh, three feet wide and you've got a worm and a stick. Those are the three. That's it. Can you execute? <laughs> and, and is that what you applied, um, you know, your TV show? Maybe you can talk about that show um, you know, how long that, the name of it, how long it ran. And, and if that, if the, if you applied those to all the fish you caught there. Well, when I got, I got into TV sort of by accident. Um, I think the first time I was on TV, it was trying, I was making lures and flies and things. I was working at a retail store just out of college. And, uh, it was a bad experience. We were melting soft plastic and somebody kicked the, the uh, plug in on the, you know, out. It was a, in a stage. And so the plastic didn't get up to heat and it, it never, um, uh, it has to go through a cycle. So it'll cure, you know, like when it cools and it never did. And so we're pouring these worms and it was like sticky crap. And then there was feathers that from something we'd done before. And the host and I ended up with feathers all over us and all this sticky stuff. And it was live television and it was just awful. And then some years later, I got a phone call from uh, Roland Martin and uh, they'd, they'd spent a couple of weeks up in this part of the world trying to catch a something put on TV. And it was in the fall. And I, uh, I, I would, had been on the road for a week. And water temps were perfect, and so I took them on musky fishing. And uh, we had a actually a double, and uh, they were it was it went real well. And then he got my, uh, or I think Al Linder called. Uh, they were talking, and Al wanted to go fishing with me. And then he had a, we did. He offered me a job. I, I produced the In Fisherman television shows for a number of years. And I worked worked there for uh, some number of years, and that's where I got my first experience in television. And as you know, they're you know real hardcore uh, uh, educational type stuff. And uh, from there, I moved on to uh, uh, my own show, the, the Hunt for Big Fish. I got kind of tired of the, the tournament angles and and so on. But In Fish had hired me primarily to uh, introduce fly fishing for species warm water species so we introduced the first uh the, the fly pike stuff that we did way back with the in fish uh started a, a warm water or a cool water revolution uh, across canada because of the things that you could do uh differently with a fly rod on these fish that uh work better than what the conventional uh, stuff was. So it was kind of fun. Hmm. My dog is barking. I'm going to let her in here real oh, quick. Oh, okay. Yeah, go for it. Okay, come on, Mojo. Mojo's 15, and Mojo has seen more muskies landed, I would bet, than any dog who has ever lived. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> And is a Mojo, Mojo what, what kind of dog is what? Mojo? She's a 85-pound yellow lab. I was going to say lab. To... I was going to say lab, yeah. Yeah, she could say, uh, I want to run. She sounded like a Scooby-Doo. She, you know, I was yep. teaching her to talk, but she's losing <laughs> her voice. <laughs> Where are you at now? What, what part of the world? Uh, I live uh, north of Minneapolis, about an hour on the, mini on the Minnesota-Wisconsin border. 
It's a little yeah. town of about a thousand people, Taylor's Falls. Okay. And is that near where you grew up? Yeah, about uh, maybe 30 miles from where I was born. Oh, perfect. And musky, so yeah, obviously you're up there, you know, in a, a good place for that. Are there, I mean, out of, out of the other species you caught, uh, you know, is there one that kind of comes to mind as the one that, you know, is just the one you might, if you had to choose one that you'd go with, is it musky or is it another one? In the whole world or where I live? Yeah, yeah, in the world. The, from what you fished, you caught, you, you fished oh, around the world, man. yeah. Wow. Well for anybody i mean you ask yourself well you know what is it about a fish well it's partly the fish partly the place right you know for me it's a it's about involving all of my senses uh i'd rather catch a fish that i could see him first because i get excited just when i see him and then i'd like to be able to throw something and watch him eat it and then I'd like him to run real fast and jump real high and, and all that so that it can involve my ears and stuff as well as my eyes. I want to hear him roar. So you break it down that way. And it's pretty hard to beat tarpon fishing if you've got the right environment. And tarpon are neat fish just because they use every environment imaginable. Uh, tarpon are fascinating creatures. I fished them in Africa. I fished them in some places in South America that uh, you probably never heard of. The Orinoco Delta, uh, places where people, you know, haven't gone. Uh, we had one at Trinidad. Uh, we landed here a few years ago, taped out of like 265 pounds. I, I've got uh, a video of some in Africa that were, there was one being weighed that was like three 345, uh, 345 pounds that was caught in, uh, Gabon. Wow. And, uh, I know another one in Angola is bigger than that. But yeah, tarpon are interesting because they use every environment. Freshwater, there's, there's tarpon that live in freshwater all the time that are there all the time. Real big ones. But they're rare, uh, and they get gonked real fast when anglers start going after them. There was a pile of them like that up at the top end of, uh, uh right where, uh, Lake Nicaragua. Uh, turns into a river. That's a real interesting area. Right. And, and tarpon, I mean, and I've heard that before. I've asked that question a few times from people and tarpon seems to be, you know, one of those species. What, I mean, and you've traveled the world, like you said, and, and been to all these places when, I mean, I'm not sure how much traveling you're doing now, but, um, you know, when you look back, what, what do you, what do you remember most about all your travels? I mean, cause some people probably would love to do what you've done and maybe never have a chance. What, what, what do you remember from your, your life doing that? Yeah, I, I've been in 89 countries. I haven't fished in all of them, uh, but the species, uh, and many of them, I'd go there, there. I just would pick the spot and look at the map, you know, like I'm a Martian on a flying saucer that knows what he's looking for. And so there's got to be, I mean, that is a fish spot. There's got to be something there. And a lot of places are, you know, not really developed. So the coolest, some of the coolest spots, I remember that some of the neatest things, some of the, the there's a tarpon uh, fishery in Nicaragua that the Nicaraguans didn't even really know about that it, it, it took a while. Uh, there's, the, the, it's, the population is so much greater uh, than the countries that surround it. It's, it's like where they, where they all come from. The river depths of the river basins can be 110 feet, 115 feet. The little rivers that we fish in Costa Rica, you're lucky if you got 20 feet. It doesn't, I mean, we're talking about carrying capacity. That's a big part of what I look for. And, uh, now real, really interesting. And, uh, it's all so, so fly fishable. Another one way, way up in Colombia. It's actually closer to the Pacific ocean than it is the Atlantic where you start out. That's an unbelievable, unbelievably beautiful, incredible fishery. And there's rivers there that <laughs> incredible volume gets the most, uh, there's a, a region that's most plant, uh, rainfall on anywhere on uh, planet earth. And, uh, Big tarpon in the lagoons, tarpon of all sizes. That's the neat thing. You know, you don't see missing year classes like you do in so much of the water for, you know, humans uh, are. So the ba the baby tarpon you, you enjoy. Do you like catching, would you rather catch a baby tarpon or a giant? No, 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 baby. I will not, I will not allow baby tarpon to be fished for if I am with, yeah. In my experience, uh, 80, 90% of them uh, 
just by flopping the heads around and going, we'll have gill detachment happen. And these lagoons I'm talking about, I'm not talking about baby tarpon. I'm talking about catching tarpon. Most of them are going to be 60 to 90 pounds. And every now and then you run into one that's pushing 200. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, you know, eight footer, eight and a half footer. They're they're of all sizes. And these lagoons aren't little poopy doo lagoons, you know. That's the stuff, the second largest lagoon on Earth. On Earth is the Pearl Lagoon in, in Nicaragua. But interestingly, they don't use the Pearl Lagoon itself, what you can see on the map, because it's really, really shallow, most of it. But the stuff that connects to it has got channels, and then there will be other lagoons off of it that might range in depth from 15 to 35 feet. The ones that have got a little deeper basins, uh, in my experience, had tarpon in them all the time. And then they uh, join up to a couple of big rivers that got basin depths, 85, 110 clear water, acres and acres of tarpon that are fully mature tarpon in the, in the right times. If you look in the right places, there are acres of them on the surface touching each other, rolling around. It's beyond what belief. And so there are places. And that's one of the magic ones for one of the magic fish. But, you know, the thrill in any kind of angling, even in your home water, is the act of discovery, learning something new. And, uh, you know, I've been fishing from home. I love to fish where I grew up. I still just love it. Always learning, suffering, you know, you watch them around, see what's going on. Where did you, um, you know, the Dahlberg Diver has come up a number of times. Where, can you tell us how, how that came to be? Um, and was that? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, I've always been a guy. The trout guys drove me nuts because they didn't animate their, their flies. Uh uh, I was a guide, you know, for fly fishermen, and these guys get, you know, what hatch? And so the honkers, uh, the, <laughs> the mallards. <laughs> no, what should I use? Uh, well, here, put this on. Well, what does it look like? It, I don't know. It looks like food. Here's how you work it. And so it was more like, what does it do? More than what does it look like? And uh, growing up as a lure fisherman and so on, you know, that's just where my head was at. And so anyway, I had a very large fish I was trying to catch. It was a large bone. And I couldn't get it to bite on a popper. It had come rushing up and stop. And I could get it to, I knew right where it was. And uh, we had, my dad had a fishing partner who had a fishing partner named Frank Suick, who invented a musky lure called a Suick. And uh, we had just seen these things and, uh, the muskies that would just follow our stuff would eat the suics. And what the suic did would, it was a dive and rise bait. And when it rose, it didn't back up with its tail, you know, how a, how a regular lure, most lures like a crankbait of any kind of lip, you crank it down, you stop it, and it backs up when it rises, right? The suic would do is go down and kind of hang, and then it would rise and swim slightly forward, head up. And that dive and rise thing was magic. And so I was trying to create a, a head design that I could get to dive. And what, what happens, it goes below, below the plane. When, when a fish is looking at something, uh, it depends on whether he's predator or prey, but most of them have got a cone type vision, right? And uh, they can't see down unless they tip. And so anyhow, if you get something to go below that plane, uh, especially a predator, he gets kind of fired up and he'll oftentimes give a kick and go after it because it's like going out of sight. It's like, like, like going around a corner, you know, taking a, you know, teasing a cat, get the thing around the string. You can't, or, you know, boom, be good. Anyway, um, I was trying to create uh, shapes that would do that. But if you try to create a lip shape uh, with a fly, obviously you can't cast it the parameters of what you can do with a fly design versus what you can do with a lure design are very very different so i figured out a way to make a diving collar that was upside down and backwards that would as i put pressure on it it would collapse a little bit so it was castable and then it would also be tunable in the water i figured that out and uh like screwing out a little bit and then I went over and uh, in the early, early morning, and I threw this thing out and went, and this bass came charging after it, and uh, he got behind it, and then I went, 
and it dove below the surface in front of his nose and he slurped it up. And I caught him and he weighed six pounds, seven ounces. And I blew off the fly and squeezed it and put it in my box and hurried up. And then I went and met the president of 3M, a guy named Bert Cross, who had uh, made the, he's the guy that made the, uh, I think the microspheres, you know, the reflective stuff that's in the uh, stop signs and highways. And uh, he was my client. And uh, I'd given another fly to his buddy that day. And his buddy caught a three and a half pound smallmouth on this fly that was with a, made out of flash of boo. I think it was before that was marketed. Nobody, did. I just had the stuff. I didn't have a name for it. And Bert was mad because he'd never caught a three and a half pounder. You could get an honor roll if you catch one of those. And so I pulled him up this river. It was real hard as a crib, but I pulled him up and I gave him, and we got to this eddy here, cast there, sloppy caster, and he, he, he you know, fished with a 10 weight. And, uh, and anyway, nothing bit. And so I took this this thing that smelled like a large mouth out of my box and handed it to me. And he goes, what in the is that? And I said, it's here, just put it on and throw it out there. And uh, he ties it on, he throws it out and it goes, he's got a real sloppy line and uh, the current kind of comes tight and the fly goes blah, 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 under the water and uh pow fish gets it and he cranks on it with this 10 weight and i just had a rather soft aberdeen hook on it and he ping he didn't hook it and the fly went to the wrong side of the boat in the middle of the river he was sitting on a swivel chair and he kind of spun around and he's going to start retrieving the fly and bam another one hit it and he caught that when he's turned around he says larry i think you got something here and that was the invention of it that was it that was it is there anything um you know, similar to it, or there's probably been some copycats and stuff like that along the way. But before that, what was the closest thing that was out there? There wasn't anything even closely Nothing. close. But Nobody was really doing hair. Well, yeah. Oh, there's lots of people doing hair. You know, you had poppers. And there was a whole yeah. bunch of popper designs. And then there was a design, you know, made out of a, a cork to begin with and so on. And people took those same basic shapes and you just made them out of deer hair. And then there was a fly that was that we used to use in the, for smallmouth that, that, that was called a wilder dilge. Uh, and that was named after two guys. It was a pointed head. And I, I kind of renamed them. I call them sliders because that's what they do. But that's about all. That's all we had. The difference with... What you were doing, the idea you had, you wanted to, the way you designed that head. It makes it well, di- obviously dive right the, it, in a specific fashion. Yeah, I had to make a head that would dive and still track straight, like a crankbait. But I don't have the option of being able to move the eye like you do on a crankbait if it goes right or left. So you had to get the collar position right and the the length of the hook. Uh, if you have too much tail behind it, the the uh, collar creates a vortex and it'll go and suck the tail up. Uh, so you need to make tail a little bit longer, but that whole thing is what makes the fly wiggle around and uh, look cool. Uh, most people that tie them, uh, I tie a lot of them with a, with a first strip tail. Uh, if you tie it with a like the pre-cut strips that are perfectly straight, uh, terrible fly. And that's how almost all of them are made. What I do is tie it like a it's a trapezoid shape on top, and then you taper it to a point. And that way it doesn't uh, get all screwed up when you cast and doesn't uh, tangle and just works a lot better. I've never done a video on a time, I don't think. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, no, there's plenty of them out there. People have, uh, <laughs> there's like, uh, there's probably hundreds of them out there that have t- tied your fly, I'm sure. Yeah, online. I've got, uh, I've got, like with every lure and all the stuff I make, I've got so many variations. It depends on what I'm trying to, you know, accomplish. Gotcha. I never color within the lines. That's one of the things I've really never done yeah yeah you mentioned um you mentioned flashaboo is that that product is that something you created as well yeah I man i've been a flashaboo like a zillion years ago and the, we started marketing and i took it and it, it ties in with the diver um uh one of the well like i said the president of 3m and the head chemist for 3m and the head of new business ventures for 3m were members of the fly fishing club that i guided for and um, they were connected with scientific anglers. 
because they bought that company because Scientific Anglers was buying microspheres to put in goop to laminate over uh, um, uh, braided material to make the modern fly line, right? You knew that. And a guy named Lou Jewett uh, was the head of new business ventures, uh, ventures. and he was a uh, uh, one of our uh, members. Excellent angler, really cool guy, really neat guy. And uh, he sent Dave Whitlock up to fish with me. Whitlock was working with him uh, back at that in those days. Would have been in the gosh late sixties, early seventies. And anyway, he came up. And uh, he had all these really cool looking flies and all that. And he was making a tour of the country, visiting all these young guys. So I took him out and uh, we fished a few spots and they just, you know, wasn't producing. So I dropped the, the hook. He said, just let me make a couple of casts and something's goofy here. And I tied on a diver and I flipped it out across this uh, pool and I was fishing the tail out. It was real low water. And I, you know, boom, boom, boom. And I had a flash of blue tail on a diver and bing, bing. I caught a couple of fish, just bing, bing like that. And I said, man, I don't know, you know, maybe you ought to use this thing. He says, what the hell is that? Well, you got some kind of a trick fly line or something makes it go down. I said, no, no, it's just the way I, I you know, showed him. It's like, I, I used to fly kites. I made kites and airplanes and stuff as a little kid. So for me, designing a lure, I'm not thinking about what I, even what it looks like or what color it is or any of that. I'm thinking about hydrodynamics. How do I make this thing? You know, it's like a kite, right? So I explained to him, here's how it works. Here, tie it on. And it's got a bunch of fish on it. He was just blown away. He says, uh, man, you got to share this with the world. This other stuff, you got to figure out a name for it. This is, this, this is freaking amazing. That, that was, when, you know, flash boom. So I came up with the name Flashaboo and he says, okay, I'll make a deal with you. You have to give me the rights to the diver fly for a year or whatever it is. And then I'll help you promote this, this material. So I said, okay. And we worked out a, a deal like that. And he went to Umpqua, you know, he had that deal with the Umpqua feather merchant. And a uh, time went by and I was just starving. I had a little kid and wife and, you know, working as a fishing guy and then uh, time went by and he didn't want to do that deal anymore and uh um i negotiated a deal with uh umqua and i can't remember the rest of sort of history and uh, i got a couple of partners and they run the we run the developed big fly fiber and stuff for making uh, real big flies a whole bunch of materials and things and i have a, a partner that runs that uh so anyway yeah that was that was kind of the history and then whitlock wrote a story about the diver in a fly fisherman magazine yeah dave we had dave whitlock on here in episode 160 i'll put a link in the show notes to that episode um so people could take a look at it and that was a good one but yeah i mean the flash i'm sitting here looking at my fly tying desk and i've got piles of flash you know and all all sorts of different colors i so i you know thank you for that it's definitely something i you know i've caught a lot of fish because of that material do you have if you had to pick do you have one color you really love or one type out of that or depends what color the water is yeah it's hard to beat plain gold in most of the smallmouth situations you mentioned smallmouth. I mean, largemouth uh, obviously has been, I mean, you've got a whole group of fishermen, right, that are on your, um, I guess, on the circuit, essentially. Is that, talk about that a little bit. How, how did the, you know, have you done more uh, smallmouth, more largemouth? What, what's been your history there? Well, um, <laughs> from the time I was 11 years old, you know, and I spent an average of something like 1,600 hours on the water. And I had access to lake and river. And so I was trolling. I was fishing live bait. I was fly fished. I was everything fishing. Uh, I studied Buck Perry, uh, the guy that invented the, you know, the idea of structure, cover, all that kind of stuff. Uh, he's the father of modern angling. Most people have never even heard of it. And he had a system called spoon plugging where uh, depth control speed control uh, were the two key factors uh, color size were uh, uh, aids not controls 
And uh, it works like it's unbelievably effective. It's illegal in the bass turn uh, circuits, <laughs> just to let you know how effective it is. But anyway, I studied all that stuff. So as a guide, I guided for smallmouth. Uh, we had a, a cabin on a lake. I, I fished largemouth. I would categorize one summer. I'd, I'd pick a certain element you know crankbait or uh, for largemouth or, or uh, shallow water fishing fishing a uh, slot what are the hours what are the you know how does it all work uh, for me i uh, i'm not like a normal fisherman uh really uh, i go somewhere and i like to i gotta figure out how it is you know and what we have going against us is we have to go home the fish don't they are home already and you know, it's leaving that it screws you up. And now let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. In today's world of mass produced products, Stonefly Nets has reclaimed the tradition of handcrafted care with their custom wood landing nets. Stonefly starts the design process by selecting wood for the handle based on a number of key factors, including grain pattern and depth, but they don't stop there. This piece of art is accentuated by strips of hardwood that complement and accentuate the handcrafted handle. The Stonefly uh, net not only looks beautiful, but has high-quality netting that is easy on the fish and will last for years to come. Stonefly's goal is to create a unique custom classic wood net that's second to none and can be customized for a little extra touch. For Ethan, the founder of Stonefly Nets, fly fishing has always had a traditional feel going back to fishing the three-weight bamboo rod with his great-grandmother. When Ethan designs a custom net, it's his hope that others will create amazing lasting memories for years to come. Please head over to wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to get your custom net now. That's wetflyswing.com slash stonefly, S-T-O-N-E-F-L-Y, to get started right now. And now, back to the show. Well, so so you're, I mean, you obviously done a lot of uh, gear and fly fishing, both. We've had a lot of, you know, guests. It's all gear. On, it's yeah. all gear. You guys drive It's all gear. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you don't, you don't make a distinction between fly and gear. It's all, it's all gear. Yeah. yeah. You know, why fly? There's times when it works better. There's times when, you know, do you do it because it works better, because it's more fun, or because it's the only thing I do, or because I'm an elitist? You know, there's a whole bunch of different reasons. I don't care, you know, what they are. Yeah, so. I, th- I think it's all, yeah, no, I agree. I think it's all, we're all, it's all fishing, you know, there's, <laughs> that's the bottom line. We've heard, you know, a number of people that have come up through and talked here about stories. They talk about how, you know, they started out gear fishing and then as that got, you know, essentially easy, they tried to find things that were harder and harder to do. And eventually that found themselves up, you know, like for example, we, I've interviewed people that only swing flies on the surface for steelhead. Right. So mm-hmm. the, the fact of getting harder, do you find that you get, um, you, fishing's easy for you? Did, is that something where you just get tired to something's too easy? So you move to something harder? Depends on what the deal is, you know? If you take bass, uh, let's take, uh, say, say you take largemouth bass or smallmouth, either one. I mean, something you've caught a lot of, do you, do you find that's still a challenge or is it easy for you just to go out there and pick, pick your gear and just go catch fish? Uh, I don't like to just windmill a bunch of peanuts. What I like to do is I know it's working when my heart starts beating faster. And what I like to do is, is see a great big one. Either that I knew was there in the first place or be surprised by I'll be damned. Look at that. I really like that. And then my heart beats faster. And then I like to try to catch it. That's what I like to do. I like seeing big one. And that's where the hunt for the big fish, obviously. So you don't, you know, if you're on a stream, you probably, you haven't done much like small brook trout fishing up, up around that doesn't get you fired up. up. At every single one. (laughs) (laughs) When I, okay, when I was a little kid, my old man used to just let me loose and pick me up three days later. You'd get put in jail for that now. I'm talking a little kid, seven, seven, eight, nine years old, camping with a boat alone. And at every little brook trout stream, I had sticks and a piece of line on that stick. Some were six feet long, some were three feet long, some were different, and the line and the stick were matched to the corner or the spot. 
And then I'd go turn over those little paint things and get little pink worms, this and that. And I'm talking a brook trout stream that's as wide as your arm is long. That, and then I'd catch these little brook trout and I'd stick them on a stick and I'd cook them over the fire and I could eat them like a smell. And I had those on every single brook trout stream up and down in my pond. And that was just for food. But I was, then I'd climb the trees and just look down because you didn't have polar rides back then. And I'd be pulling, I'd go below the power dams, I'd pull up and, uh, and uh, I'd catch minnows. And I'd have minnows a lot. It was hard to keep them alive, but, and, uh, and frogs and stuff. And I'd climb up in the trees and then drop and then watch, watch the fish come up and eat them and see what the deal was. And I, I just want to see where they're at, you know. And that's what I did as a kid, you know. Uh, that's, and that's why I got drafted later as a guide because I kind of knew, knew where the water was where the fish were. My first client uh, that I can remember was Bill, Philip Pillsbury. What happened, an old man named Charlie died. And there, there'd been a private fishing club. They had like three, four guides. And these uh, rich guys from all across the country would come and fish smallmouth uh, with this deal, with this thing. And, uh, and uh, Charlie died. And so, uh, emergency, Pillsbury's coming, need a guy. And uh, my dad had been bringing me along uh, with him since I was like six, seven. And I'd sit on the, on the boat seat with several cushions so I could reach the oars. And he'd say, push in the left oar, push again on the left oar, pull on the right oar. Okay, good. Pull on both oars. Okay, good. And then he'd fish the banks. And then when we got to a spot, he'd, we'd anchor and then I'd get to fish. So I was like the electric trolling motor before he had electric trolling motors. And just a little lightweight boat. So I, you know, I learned how to row uh, at a really early age. So by 11, you know, I was like really good at it. And I knew the water really well. And, and I, I knew where the fish were because I climbed trees and throw freaking frogs at them in a, you know, 15 mile stretch of water. So anyway, um, I get to go, they show up all fish with a young man. Pillsbury had been there. He was a great fly caster, like one of the best in the world. In fact, I have his fly rod, a pinky gillum. Do you know what pinky gillum bamboo rod is? No. You never heard of pinky gillum? Well, I no, have some I have. of your fly friends. Uh, they're, yeah. They could be worth 15, 20 grand. Wow. He had, th- he had three of them. And this guy could throw 90 feet of fly line with a loop tight enough to go through a keyhole sitting down when he was about 75 years old. He was amazing. But any- anyway, um, We'd get to a spot and it'd say, Mr. Pillsbury, right there by that red rock. You can't see it from here, but if you climb that tree, you can see it about three feet above it. It's right there. You know? And all day long, wherever I said, there's one right there, there was. And he thought I was a savant. The other guides were older men and guided for years. But when they fished in their own, they only fished for walleyes and stuff. And they didn't have, you know, smallmouth were just, you know, were, were, they were fishing for me, you know, was, so I had a, a more of a first hand with where they were. So anyway, I got a full-time job and then did that all through, uh, through, uh, high school and through college. And my wife and I ran the camp through, uh, uh, first few years that, uh, we were married and through our, uh, college years. So, you know, that was, I guided fly fishermen. My dad wouldn't let me ride the conventional anglers because they come back without you. The fly guys were, you didn't have to worry about them. Oh, yeah. What was the name of the, was this a, uh, the guide operation? Was there, was there a shop or a... The private club, private fishing club. What was, it was a guy named, it was a guy named Einer Nelson. Einer Nelson, St. Croix River Resort. Uh, he had evolved from a guy named Bill Houston, who had had a fly fishing operation on the Mississippi, the upper Mississippi. And then the Army Corps of Engineers came and started building wing dams, and it screwed up the river. So Pillsbury, a guy named Gattenbein, some guy uh, from Chicago that had a real big sporting goods store, and some other wealthy uh, industrialist dudes who liked to fly fish, uh, funded Houston to go find some other water. And uh, he settled up uh, just north of where the uh, snake and the kettle uh, joined the St. Croix. And uh, it was owned by a guy named Nelson. And so he hired Nelson's two boys to work for him. And they started the operation up there. And they had a spat and it became Nelson's instead of Houston's. 
Houston moved upriver. Nelson wanted to retire, and a bunch of his clients said, hey, why don't we buy you out, and you kind of manage it, and uh, get us some guides, and we'll have a private club limited to 12, 13 members. So that's what they did, and that's when I came into the picture. And then when Nelson got a little older, well, I ended up uh, managing the place and living there, and uh, that's that. So That's that. That's, that's all that. I, yeah. There you go. And then, so from that phase, I mean, you've, uh, you have a lot of bass plugs, right. That you've designed and things like that. People are, I think people have won on the bass circuit. Can you talk about how, you know, that all came to be? Was that just a natural progression from your, your guiding days? Well, I've always been a, a, a tinkerer and a maker of things since I was a little tiny kid. My dad did also my, just the way where we grew up, you know, you make stuff. I think, I guess I was at a sports show. Some, it was out in your part of the world somewhere. Uh, the Cow Palace. Where's the Cow Palace? That's in, in California. Uh, it's real cold building where they used to have uh, sports shows and stuff. Maybe they still do. Where is it? Seattle, maybe? Or I don't know. Somewhere out west. Uh, I did some sort of a presentation, and there's two little Chinese guys sitting up in the... Uh, balcony or the you know the bleachers and they came down and were chattering with me and i got to talk to them a little bit they were kind of humorous and anyway time went by and uh i'd had a bunch of stuff ripped off from me when i was in my younger years i invented something called a blank through offset fishing rod handle uh it was about 40 percent stronger and um about one third the weight of the conventional fishing rod handles that were being used. We patented it and stuff. And um, it got ripped off. Uh, the first year, I think there was $85 million worth of infringing products sold. And I made a pledge, I'm not gonna ever show anybody anything again until I'm in a position to be able to defend myself. And I had a bunch of lures and things that I'd invented and I pulled them out of the drawer here a while back and. I partnered up with uh, Simon Chan at uh, River to Sea uh, to produce uh, those lures. One of them is a whopper plopper that has really been a, a, a big hit. That's right. And, and you have, and, and guys are, uh, I mean, pretty much, right? There's pros, bass pros that are out using lots of your stuff. Is that is that something that you're... I don't, I don't, see, I don't really keep track of those guys. I, I get as far away from that crowd as I can. The more people there are, the worse it is for me. And, you know, you know, hats, patch, you know, I just, I don't know. I don't quite understand that side of it. Gotcha. So you're not out on the bass tour uh, promoting, working with those guys? I don't do that, no. I've never done that. I used to be in the board of directors for the professional walleye trail. I worked it in fishermen. But, uh, no, I don't, I don't like to me, it's, it's fishing is an existential experience. When a fish bites, it proves I exist. Um, I don't need to have a bunch of other anglers. I, I'm com- it's me and the fish. I, I don't want. I don't care about other. I had people who used to want want to get me to get into that business and uh, say, okay, I'll tell you what. You want to have a fishing tournament? It'll be me and you. I'll bet everything I own. And you bet everything you own. We'll make it a week long. I'll let you pick the spot. And then at the end, you can never fish again if I win. Hmm. And I never, never had anybody take me up on it. <laughs> That's a tough one, yeah. Just to shut them up, you know. I'd say, I would, you know, no problem. Would you take that? Would you take that bet on? Yeah, just about. There yeah, you go. sounds like I'm bragging, but you let me play by my rules. I don't care who it is. Doesn't matter who it is. You can. <laughs> What if it was steelhead? What if you're going for steelhead on the fly? No problem. Ask the guys yeah. in the home pool about Larry and steelhead back in the day. I had so much fun on the Umpqua. North Umpqua? No, North Umpqua, yeah. yeah. It's a relatively difficult river to fish, I think, uh, for most people. Right? And I went out there, I was just a kid. And those guys weren't going to show anybody anything, nothing. So I got up on all the cliffs with the with the 
binoculars and polar egg glasses, and I identified every fish that I could see in that stream that was identifiable as a living creature. And then there was fly water. There's a line right there, fly water and uh, bait water. You know what that is? Oh, yeah. 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 There was a kind of a gas station or something there. So I went and looked at all this stuff, and I went and I tied some uh, deep wigglers. It's a fly. I used to call it a double or nothing fly for smallmouth. I had spot a smallmouth, and I put my anchor down. I tell my client, you can catch him. And if you can catch him, I say, okay, I'll bet you double or nothing. If I can't catch it in three casts, um, you don't have to pay me today. But if I catch it in three casts, you got to pay me double if you take, take the bet. And I never lost a bet. And I, I used to practice with a red Brillo pad and an ice fishing weight. It's a little clip weight. You, it's got a clipper. You can clip it under a Brillo pad and throw it in the water and I'll stay there. And I'd practice uh, upstream, man, 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 with an unweighted fly or super lightweight, and then pick that brill pad off the bottom, teaching dead dirt drift, you know, a targeted dead drift. And um, do it with a segmented fly, about an inch, inch and a half long. Can't be too big, but it's got to be big enough so you can see it. And uh, anyway, uh, well, and then you got to lengthen your leader long, 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 you know, depending. I'm using floating, all floating, floating lines. And I, so it, the trick is that you got to cast far enough upstream and do it. Same thing as Atlantic salmon fishing thing. Mandrill line, mandrill line, get a dread, dead free, drag free drift, thing right in the pipe, and then go twitch, twitch, and they go, <laughs> and eat it. And uh, it was very effective on the pump. And I had a wonderful experience. I had this hole. It was a tough one to fish. And uh, there was this idiot there uh, fishing uh, kind of the bottom uh, part of the pool. And uh, or it's, there's two pools together. So he's kind of in the neck down in between the two of them. And he's makes like 10 casts and then changes flies and makes 10 casts and changes flies and hmm. makes 10 casts. And I'm waiting for him to get the hell out of there. Because there's some fish below him, a bunch of them below him, and there's some fish above him in the buckets. And you might see one flash now and then. And I know if I can get there, I'll just go catch him. So anyway, I'm watching for an hour and a half, waiting for in the sun on the Umpqua. You can wait a long time before the shadows hit the river because it's so narrow. And um, he's got like 12 thousand. You can't even see his little fly puff ball holder thing that he's got on his vest because he's got so many flies on it. And I'm way up above him with these binoculars, and he's putting on his 8,800th fly, and there's a little flash, and the fish moves up and is laying in front of him first time all morning. And it, he puts out his purple fladeau or whatever the hell it was that he had tied on, and boom, fish on, fish on, I finally figured him out. <laughs> he runs down the stream. So I go up that evening, and I see him, uh, and then he leaves, and I went and caught a bunch of them. And it didn't even matter that the sun was up. I was real low water and they got down under the bumps. You know, and, and, I, and I had to use a few little split shots up high on the leader. And anyway, I get up to the steamboat inn or whatever that evening. And here's this guy. He's tying flies like crazy, this purple fadu or whatever it was. And telling the story about it. He tried everything. And on the first cast, man, they hit this thing. And this is what it was. And, you know, I wonder if that ever happened before. Right. No, that's funny. That's funny. I'm more, yeah, yeah, yeah I, 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 I'm more, I have one fly that I kind of, that works pretty much most of the time. I stick with that. What, what, you know, you've, like I said, you, a lot of people have mentioned you, the influence of you, you know, and the stuff you've done over the years and you've been everywhere. Do you have one thing, you know, you think about to date that you're kind of most proud of in your fly fishing or in your not fly fishing, just in fishing in general? Oh, proud that some what I enjoy most is um, I, I enjoy the lure making uh, stuff and he, and teaching people how to do that. Uh, we had a, a thing we did a while back. Uh, went over to I think we went to Sweden and uh, taught a class of young guys and a few girls uh, how to build fishing lures. They have a uh, interesting schools over there where they teach skills instead of uh, general knowledge and this was like a outdoor type thing and uh 
just the having unleashing people's creativity i think is the thing that i enjoy most to see the light go on and i'll say hey look i made this and it worked uh and the excitement of you know connecting them to what they're doing instead of just sort of you know running out and buying whatever color jimmy houston caught the three pounder on you know but uh yeah getting connected to what you're doing in a in an organic manner uh and i think connect making those connections is a thing that's most satisfying not to me that's great yeah i love that you went to the mentioned the teaching i my grandpa used to make those old wooden um lures used to carve them and stuff and my dad still you know i remember always seeing those and it was really cool um but you've done a lot of i mean both synthetic and kind of organic you mentioned that at the start it's all organic from the standpoint of you know the approach um the problem with using natural materials is uh first obtaining them sometimes uh, woods all have different uh, buoyancy, different specific gravities. And even within one one piece of wood, uh, that piece near the heartwood has a totally different buoyancy uh, than the wood on the outside of it. And you get a little bit of each on a, on a piece. Now, yeah, it's hard to control. And I found that the, the urethanes and the uh, foams and the uh, various things that uh, uh, we're using uh, – are not only much less expensive and easier to work with, uh, but much more consistent. So, you know, I, I can, it's pretty funny if you, you get a kick out of visiting my, my workshop, you could go down and you'll find the um, cedar era. Uh, my dad worked for the electric company. Everyone in my family, except for me, I think uh, worked for the electric company. My great grandfather uh, came from uh, Sweden and they started the electric companies back when they're teeny little, you know, like a little, you know, where a little, there's a guy sitting there with a lever letting water go through a wheel. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, they used to use white cedar. And so the old poles uh, would rot and it's before they had chemicals and we'd use white cedar for kindling uh, to keep the house warm. That white cedar is just the most wonderful material uh, to make uh, lures out of. And uh, I used to have an endless supply because of the old uh, uh, light poles that would be retired. But uh, they don't use that material anymore. Uh, but the uh, urethanes and, and so on, the foams, and, and also for fly, uh, for tying diver, making diver heads, uh, that, that's the way to go. Uh, I mix... I've never, never done, I don't know if we ever did a, a piece on it or not, but I'll mix a rubber foam, a, a rubberized material, like a 30 gameter, 20 gameter uh, urethane rubber with the urethane foam, and then put it in a mold, and you can make a really good fl uh, flexibility if you need on the uh, material. You can dictate the buoyancy of it, and it's so fast. That's great. Uh, yeah. yeah, it works really, really well. Flexible and floats. <laughs> mm -hmm. we're going to uh larry we're going to get out of here pretty quick here but i had a, just a couple of notes i wanted to make sure before we, we touch on um you know a person that you know has been obviously another big influencer around the you know the fishing space was lefty cray and you knew lefty a little bit can you can you talk about um maybe just what you think of when you think of lefty or maybe a story that you can help shed some light on on the guy i mean obviously we know he had a pretty big impact as well the lefty and i first met back when um, he worked with uh, 3M, same connection, Lou Jewett. Uh, and we went out and did a bunch of casting stuff together. I was in my mid twenties and uh, we went to a few stores and, and uh, got together and we uh, stayed in contact for the next, I guess that would be 50 years or, or something. And um, he was always just real flattering um, about you know, me not need much help with uh, my casting. Uh, and I sent him, uh, <laughs> I sent him flies. I sent him, uh, he knew about Flashable really, really early. And he, he'd always you know, send me a note. And I'd send him a bunch of, a bunch of uh, flies, uh, called, him, called him pencil flies. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And uh, the last years, 
that he was alive, uh, we had an opportunity to spend some time together fishing uh, in Texas uh, at Rick Polk's uh, ranch. Oh, yeah. And uh, I got a lot of letters from him. I've got a, around the corner here a box with a Abu 6000 in it with some drag modifications. Or, you know, Lefty used to fish with conventional gear as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I've, I've got letters and notes and stuff that go back from way back. Yeah, Lefty was a Lefty was a good friend. We didn't spend that much time together, but like he said to me, the first time it was interesting. We're driving in my in my car with a red '68 Plymouth, I think, headed to some little place in Wisconsin, and we were in the midst of a deep discussion, and. Um, he said, you know, Larry, men and women are a lot different. He says, women, if they can't see each other once a week or so, they just forget they exist. He says, but men, he says, guys like me and you who are like, like-minded, like we can have a talk like this, not see each other again for 15 years. We'll pick up the conversation right where we left off. And he was yeah. absolutely yeah. right. Absolutely right about that. That's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, that's you good. can't say that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right no no yeah exactly exactly yeah, i haven't woke up yet i'm not woke yeah <laughs> that's right yeah Actually, we're gonna... i can't be woke because i don't go to sleep yeah are you uh so so do you are you kind of a night owl uh it's terrible um i'm up almost every morning by four or four thirty and when i was younger i'd go to bed at about midnight and now i go to bed earlier than that but uh, most of my life, I've been the last one to bed, first one up. Just that's just the way I'm wired. That's it. And you're and now, uh, how old are you now? Uh, I think I'll be seventy two in December. Yeah. So you're early seventies, and it sounds like you're doing pretty well. That's funny because that's exactly how I am. I'm. I've always had that thing where I love staying up late and I love getting up early, and I find myself. People tell me I don't get enough sleep, but it sounds like you're doing pretty good on uh, <laughs> having having done that. You just have to make make your sleep count, I guess. When I sleep, a bomb can go off, and I might not wake up. So, <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. That's that's interesting. There you go. So we have something in common. We found something that's good. Um, what about uh, you know these some couple of random ones as we as we start to wrap it up here? Um, you know, do you have any any vices? Any any you know things that are kind of you know whether fishing or just in life things that you had to maybe quit over over your time or that you've you know maybe haven't been the best things for you? Well, I got three fly time vices sitting amidst the bottles of urethane, but that's not what you're talking about. No, I smoke cigars. No. Yeah, I smoke way too many cigars. Oh, there you go. Yep. You still you still smoke a, a cigar every every once in a while? Way too often. Yeah, it keeps the deer flies away. Yeah, that's right. That's right. No, I know. I had a I have a friend that smokes cigars, and we had some on the river. Yeah, there's something about it. It's definitely. Uh, it's definitely nice. It's uh, it's not quite the same as smoking a cigarette. Obviously, it's different, but I, I can see how that would be a good uh, a good vice to have, <laughs> or hard one to get rid of. <laughs> yeah. All right, Larry. Well, I, I think you know. Obviously, there's there's a uh, you know a number of things that we we didn't totally dig into here. But anything else you want to leave us with? I know um, as far as if somebody doesn't know you, maybe they're listening to you for the first time. Any other products or things you've done that you want to highlight before we get out of here? Uh, not really. No, I'm just my life is going really well. I can go fishing whenever I want to. How often do you fish now? Are you fishing uh, like more or less than you used to fish? Well, I fish just about every day. <laughs> it's there you go. Terrible. Yeah. That's yeah, amazing. It's the weekend, so I, I'm not out, you know, like I think I told you before, I don't do podcasts in the middle of the day. And typically, uh, I would be back, coming back about now. And I'd have caught, I, I could have caught a couple of muskies this morning, I'm pretty sure. That's right. Yeah. We didn't even touch on the muskie, which is a, a super uh, amazing and, and hard to catch fish, right? Do you want to give us a... Before, as we get out of here, do you want to give us uh, somebody who maybe is going for musky a tip on catching musky? Oh man, is there is it? They're hard, aren't they? <laughs> You're catching a really big fish are inversely proportional to how much you actually deserve it. I'll leave you with that. Oh, time. So it's like steelhead, and, uh, but, but is it harder? Is it harder than steelhead? Do you think? Oh yeah, 
yeah, it's just because steelhead, you got to run. So they're, here they are. They're right there, you know, and you might even be able to see one. And you know, there's a focus, you know, there's a concentration. Uh, and musky fishing, uh, typically, uh, the distribution, you know, is, is a lot less. They're way high up on the food chain. And so it is, it is somewhat more difficult. Uh, depends on how you go about it. You know? Do you have a musky fly that you, you like to use? Uh, flies are really effective for muskies for a bunch of different reasons. But uh, I use a big diver, big mega diver. I caught many, many, many. Genre. My favorite is to when uh, the when uh, the fish come up shallow in a pre-spawn thing. Uh, water temps about sixty actually in uh, northern northern Minnesota and Wisconsin, uh, southern Ontario. Uh, you take a uh, about five inch long first strip divers, floating line and a wet tip line, and you can sight fish for great big muskies, and it's really really fun that's the most fun fly fishing for them uh, the most consistent is throwing big flies in rivers uh on a season to season to season basis and a lot of the guys now are throwing big jointed flies with a 12 12 weight uh, fly rod and you know a line that's 100 grains heavier than a 12 ought to be and man it's a lot of work uh you really want to just go catch one with a fly and, and be most enjoyable, have the highest possible odds of uh, uh, sight fishing them. Water hits 60. I think I wrote an article about it. Yeah, in the spring, that's, that's the time that you want to do it. Just as it's approaching 60, they start sliding in. I wrote an article on how to do that in the uh, International Game Fish Association magazine about that uh, back in the 90s. It's somewhere in their life go through every detail ding 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 show you exactly how to do it it's like a lock perfect all right good stuff all right larry well i'll leave it at that and uh and i guess if people have questions we can send them over to uh, huntforbigfish.com yeah and there should be an ask larry forum a lot of it be getting a lot of russian pornography on it oh gosh and i hope that's not from your audience (laughs) <laughs> I don't. I don't think so. We're we're pretty. We try to keep it. Uh, you know, keep the uh, the profanity and, and, and pornography to a minimum for sure on on the show. We we have sponsors, so I don't want to like uh, disrupt that at all. Who are your sponsors? I'm curious. Who are your sponsors? Uh, we have a number of different sponsors right now. Currently, we have. Um, gosh, we have a, a mix. We've got uh, OPST is a fly rod company. Uh, we have uh, Sawyer Oars makes uh, uh, oars and paddles for drift boats. Um, they're right up have, here. Uh, I think they're my part of the world. Well, they're all yeah. They're they're huge. They're they're one of the big uh, you know companies that makes oars. Uh, we have uh, Turtle Box Audio. They're out of uh, out of Texas. They make a portable Bluetooth uh, speaker, which is kind of an interesting one. Um, we have uh, a net company, um, uh, Stonefly Nets is another another one then our uh, the other one we have right now is angler's coffee a really cool local coffee company that's making coffee spe- specifically for kind of the angling community so it's a good mix but yeah we have some really great they're really great companies i love it i like the coffee idea you make it strong enough so that you just start shaking and twitching it's right like here, here flip this flip this on and drink a cup of this and just stand there <laughs> Exactly. Well, the guy, uh, Joe, Joe, the founder, he, he, you know, made, uh, you know, millions of dollars in another company and, and kind of sold that he couldn't retire. He couldn't, he couldn't stop. So he, he always wanted, he always loved fishing. So he's like, you know what, I'm going to serve the fishing market with a great company and he, it's great coffee. So, I love it. Um, so yeah, 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 I'm having fun. It, it's been, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's all about having fun. It sounds like the same for you. So, um, but it's been really good to connect with you. I know a lot of people out there know you probably even better than me they're going to appreciate um hearing a little bit of the insight and hopefully we got some something new you haven't said before and and yeah until we talk again larry thanks again you're more than welcome you have a wonderful what's left of the weekend so there you go if you want to find all the show notes all the links and everything else we covered today head over to wetflyswing.com slash 241 241 we are highlighting a few lodges this year as we roll out a lodge program um and uh and giveaway program if you are connected to a lodge or know of a great lodge uh that you've been to please send me a dm on instagram at wet fly swing and i'll follow up there thanks in advance for doing that 
we got another barn burn next week uh next tuesday as brian chan is here uh, brian is the steel water guru and breaks down his step by step so make sure you uh, click the subscribe button right now so you get updated when that episode goes live that's uh that's all i have for you today that's a wrap uh want to definitely thank larry again for the great podcast it was a fun one that we did and um you know obviously he's got a big uh big influence in both gear and fly um so it's fun to hear that perspective definitely looking forward to uh, catching up with you hopefully soon and uh maybe catch you on the river or online thanks for listening to the wet fly swing fly fishing show for notes and links from this episode visit wetflyswing.com